just a little bit about where I'm from, um, North Shore LIJ Health System, which is a mouthful, it's not health literate, that's the joke, <laughs> um, is now currently 16 hospitals. Uh, we have approximately 45,000 employees, um, almost 10,000 nurses, close to 10,000 physicians, um, a medical school that we launched uh, in August of 2011, uh, long-term care facilities, an ambulance transport system, laboratory system, so we're quite large. Um, actually, one of our hospitals is in Queens, which is one of the most diverse counties in the world. Um, they speak, the population speaks over 176 languages, so uh, lots of opportunities for us to continually improve. Um, also, I just broke it down by the different attributes, and I'll just touch on them quickly as far as having leadership that makes health literacy integral to its mission structure and, structure and operations. Um, I'm happy to say that in June 2010, we launched the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Health Literacy, and that's a corporate office, so it's over all of the sites, um, ambulatory sites, hospital sites, long-term care. Um, so that was a wonderful accomplishment. Um, our Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer, Dr. Jennifer Merez, reports to our CEO and President, Michael Dowling, um, and he also receives monthly updates on the activities of our office initiatives and our plans. We have a system-wide now patient education policy and procedure process, system-wide patient education committees, and system-wide language and communication access committees. Um, beginning in May, we'll be combining those two committees into one um, because there's so many synergies, of course, across those. Uh, we also launched a Diversity, Inclusion, Health Literacy Council, and members from all of our sites, um, many of the ambulatory sites in addition to the hospitals, sit on that committee, and really it's about sharing best practices um, that each site can take back, kind of tweak for their patient population and for the resources that they have. Instead of what we found is when you're that broad, uh, even though we're all in New York, you know, one site would be doing something, then possibly another site would say, I have this great idea, and meanwhile, we were, we were doing it, you know, somewhere else. So it's about sharing best practices and changing it, though, to meet the needs of, e of each organization. Um, and now what we're really doing is working more with service lines. Instead of with the individual hospitals, we're looking at it now from a service line approach um, and system departments. So the orthopedic service line, which goes across all the hospitals, neuro, um, cardiac, et cetera, and really trying to integrate things there. As far as um, planning, we did an initial assessment at several of our sites, which showed uh, many gaps that we needed to work on. We do ongoing assessments, obviously, as we take on new hospitals, as our, our demographics change. We do integrate it into our annual mandated topics for all employees, as well as our orientations. We have various orientations um, across the system, and then day two orientations at each of the sites. So health literacy is part of that. As others have mentioned, we monitor our Prescani and our HCAP scores. Um, on Fridays, we do a patient safety Fridays throughout the organization, and it's from 10 to 12, and many times health literacy or a component of health literacy is the topic. And there's a bunch of teams, and we go out through the buildings, and everybody is from maintenance all the way up to the CEO talks about health literacy or you know clear communication, whatever the prop. Uh, topic is that day. We've also collaborated, obviously, with system quality and our um, informatics system to really help the um, end users, the, the professionals, with monitoring their compliance and documentation. As far as preparing the workforce, again, the orientations um, across the, ca the campuses, uh, the mandated topics. We're very fortunate to have um, an on-site, what we call corporate university, and it's called the Center for Learning and Innovation. So we have classes there where the sites can send their employees. We do workshops there, sessions. We also have a, a patient safety institute where we work with uh, standardized patients and film scenarios, which are multidisciplinary. We debrief afterwards, talk about it, and do it again. So we have um, lots of innovation. And we've also um, recorded some of those that are incorporated into some online modules. We have many online educational resources as well, toolkits from our office, monthly tips that go out across the organization, references and online modules, um, and also Culture Vision um, as a resource which our staff just love. <clears throat> we try to make it in various different ways, either on-site you know, or online. 
As far as meeting um, the needs of the population, um, we also decided um, at the very beginning to launch what, uh, the Dignity and Respect Campaign, which is really adapted from UPMC. Um, and in the beginning, I think many people kind of were like, you know, this is what I was taught at home. I, do, I do we really need to talk about this? Um, and I felt the same way, to be honest. I felt like I was brought up well, and uh, you know, this is kind of silly. But when you thought about it, I think there are many um, times when a professional or a provider of care doesn't realize that they might be disrespectful, and it might be because of a cultural difference, and that awareness wasn't even there. So we launched this campaign across the organization, really focused on um, inclusion, and that the more diversity we have, the more we can learn, and it's lifelong learning, and um, inclusion, inclusion with everybody. Um, and then we even went and video, made our own videotape for our, our organization with senior leaders in, that, in the videotape talking about uh, dignity and respect equals inclusion and why it's so important to patient care and patient outcomes. We also use a universal precautions approach where we um, don't assume anybody's literacy level and we um, ask, always ask preferred language first and foremost. We assess individual learning needs. Then we talk in plain language, we incorporate teach back, and then also then uh, what questions do you have? And again, we have a health literacy toolkit and we just are ready to launch our health literacy competency with our nursing staff. Done a lot of work with the EMR as far as uh, strategies to, uh, it, for communication. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm really at the point where we really wanna try to make it easy, so it's, uh, every time a language other than English is checked on the electronic medical record, that now floats up to the top banner in the electronic medical record. So it's as important as allergies. So it should be up there you know, with allergies and the patient's medical record number. Um, we have language access coordinators at each site, and they receive a, a monthly, a daily, I should say, limited English proficient patient report so that they can get that on a daily basis and go up and visit that patient, reinforce that interpretation services are being used properly, and uh, you know assess the situation. We confirm understanding, of course, by teach back, which is also in the electronic medical record. We've developed a language access audit tool for staff so they can do concurrent monitoring, um, and really are just looking also at different vendors to incorporate different services for our patients, um, including video, telephonic, and on-site. We have ongoing collaboration with marketing and PR. We do have a very good uh, collaboration. We have new processes that are in place around the development of materials. We meet regularly, we communic communicate regularly. We've developed a, a process for vetting of our information and for the translation process on homegrown materials. Uh, closed captioning is now on all our inpatient ambulatory televisions and we also work with um, consultants to enhance the materials. And again, um, in regards to high-risk situations, we've done some work with transitional care, looked at vital documents um, so that they're reflective of our changing population. Our research institute, we've done some projects there around informed consent, um, medication safety, and discharge process. So what generated the interest for us was really, um, as we're taking on more and more hospitals, it's the changing in the patient population that we're serving, um, and how low health literacy you know, so strongly correlates to patient safety and patient outcomes. Patient satisfaction scores are going to be tied to value-based purchasing, so we'll try to get it any way that we can. Um, the medical school, when you're training new, you know, physicians, it brings a different awareness and heightens the awareness of health literacy. And really, our senior leader feels that it's an integral part of providing quality care. Um, for To continue to move the strategies forward, Senior leadership, obviously, is a, a key component. The launching of our office, I think, was very helpful in that it gives that visual, and um, with senior leadership always talking about it and referring people to it and talking about the resources that are up online and things that he learned from going on it, it, it just continues to uh, keep it visible for everybody. Um, we're also identifying health literacy champions at each site, which is very helpful. People who are passionate about it, they help drive the process at, at their um, organization. And the other thing that we've found um, helpful is 
just incorporating it across every single venue that we can. So whether it's internal and external publications, whether it's screensavers that are up on the computers, throughout every committee, you know, HR, the university, even in finance, um, in financial um, access, uh, all areas, and then it just hopefully will become like hand washing is what I'm hoping. You know, it just will be automatic. Um, other thing that we're doing this year is the year real, really we're trying to move it from hospital base to a system base um, for sustainability. Otherwise, it's just going to be lots of projects being done over and over. So we're really looking at um, health literacy as a service line approach, just like we would a clinical um, service line. Also, I found what's extremely helpful is, you know, you ha we, are, we have to, what's in it for the person or the group that we're meeting with? So if it's finance, we have to tie it into something that's important to them. If it's uh, pediatricians or if it's quality, we always have to constantly change that message so that we, they can see what's in it for them. Um, want to involve it in current projects instead of always making it something extra because nobody has the time. And I think standardizing you know, the policies, the expectations, the accountability across the health system will help c continue to move this forward. <coughs> Facilitating the implementation, again, it's, this baseline assessment was helpful. I have to say, you know, 2010, with all the initiatives that came out, the tipping point, it was good timing. It helped, I think, move it along. Um, to Ruth's point, with the, uh, the attributes of a health literate organization, you know, I find that helpful in that every year when we re look at our strategy, you know, we can go back to that. And having that one page overview is very helpful because senior leadership across large organizations don't, you only get two minutes. You know, you get that elevator speech. So by giving a high level overview with the detail behind it, that's extremely helpful. Um, again, the continuing classes, the tips, health literacy module, and the committees will just help with that implementation. The barriers, I think, as many have already mentioned, it's time consuming. Um, I hear a lot about nursing. I think, um, you know, nurses, I'm a nurse. I think they're, they're advocates, they're with the patient, but I think we have to start looking. Nurses can't do everything all the time. So um, I'm really trying to look at the team approach. Um, and uh, we're having some challenges, you know, getting phys physician participation as compared to the others. Um, you can't tell by looking. It's not, not like someone can come in and we can tell. So I think that's a barrier, you know, because it, the other thing I, I often say is because it applies to really everybody, regardless, um, then nobody owns it. Um, so if it was something that related, was important for the cardiology subspecialty, at least they would all get on board and start. But because this is so cross-cutting, everybody kind of says, oh, well, that's not, not my problem. So um, I think we need to reinforce that it really belongs to all. And the assumptions that it's not a particular person's, you know, patient demographic. Um, so, continuing work there. The growth of the office will help sustain that. You know, even though the office in the summer will just be three years old, we've already, you know, gotten several more FTEs, and we continue to grow um, based on deliverables. So, I think that will help um, ongoing awareness and education. Again, the integration is key, and um, holding people accountable across the system. And again, you know, um, tying it back into as an health literacy as an essential component to excellent patient care, I think is uh, a message that everyone will agree with. So thank you so much for your time.